Well, I uh, think we can go ahead and get started, get fired off. Only got an yep. hour here, and uh, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna fill it up pretty quickly. We've got some very interesting folks up here talking about EVs, talking about breaking records, talking about where we're at and where we're going. It's still a uh, very new thing, especially on the performance side of things. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm Alan Reinhardt. They call me the voice of the National Hot Rod Association, but I'm not in that capacity here today. I'm just going to kind of moderate the panel. I've been following along and paying attention to some of the stuff that's happened in the electric movement, especially on the quarter mile side of things. But we're going to uh, talk about not just that, but we're going to expand on some other stuff that's going on here today as well. I'm being joined first, John Metric, who is with Lone Star EV, and that is obviously down in Texas, the Lake Jackson area. And as I understand it, I've uh, been involved with Nedra for a long time as well. You have actually been involved in electric longer than a lot of people have. Can you maybe uh, just give us a little bit about your background and how you got started? Just start talking. He'll turn you on. Or you can borrow mine. To check. See? Just talk. He'll turn you on. All right. Um, back in um, 2009, I, was, I found these guys up in... Uh, um, this fella in uh, Alaska, I was up in Alberta and I saw this uh, guy was raising the wheels up on a uh, Pinto, his name was Mike Willman, and uh, turns out they were a group of this uh, uh, association called National Electric Drag Race Association, and one of the big cars at the time was the White Zombie there, and uh, it had a history going back all the way to the, you can see the gassers there, that somebody's got electric, a lead acid battery powered uh, Drag Street did 100 miles an hour, and uh, from that they started sanctioning uh, records and uh, writing safety rules, and then uh, I got involved in uh, 2010 and ran for president and won, and then uh, I just retired and handed it off to Alan here last year, and um, we've built, uh, so I built a Pontiac, and then I built a a Miata and then a dra rail dragster and you uh, actually you mentioned Alaska you actually played with some electric snowmobiles right I was I was watching him run an electric snowmobile and I said how the heck is he so far ahead of those like <laughs> 700 horsepower you know engines and he's running a little 24 volt starter motor and my my brain was like how does he how is he doing that well if you gear it properly and these things make like a hundred foot pounds of torque well, he's making a thousand foot pounds of torque at the, you know, like, uh, he didn't win the race, but uh, that bugged me over the winter. And uh, I was up northern Alberta. And, um, and that's where I got into it. Met the guys in there in uh, Alaska. All right. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us here today. Uh, sitting next to him is Steve Huff, who is the current speed record holder, at least for cars. Over 200 miles an hour, the first one to do that. A uh, car called Current Technology. And you have kind of an interesting racing background. I mean, boats, motorcycles, um, a little bit of everything. How did you first get involved with the electric movement? Uh, yeah, Alan, first, uh, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for showing up here. Our, uh, I got involved with it. You know, my racing career i've been a, a gearhead my whole life right since school like most of us and it was always about you know building fast cars and you know street to you know stoplight racing and i i had an opera but we didn't have much growing up so racing to me was way out of reach there wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna have a chance to race I, you know when i was in junior elementary school we were homeless i didn't have anything we so it was seemed out of reach but uh, i was a great mechanic but i wanted to race and a girlfriend of mine bought me a day trip at, at Laguna Seca uh, to the Jim Russell Driving School. And uh, it was over from there. I wanted to go into road racing. We've seen electric get into road racing now. I wanted to drive a champ car. I ended up at a, but I'm a gearhead. I ended up at a top fuel, at a, at a motorcycle race. And I see a top fuel Harley go 200 miles an hour in six seconds. I bought one the next day. I said, this is what I got to do. So I went racing fuel bikes, set some records racing the fuel bikes. Uh, did that for about seven years. Again, just purest of, um, you know, fan, I was a fan of Don Garlitz, of who wasn't. And so that career is going along. Then I started getting involved in racing cars and building junior comp cars uh, for the NHRA. It's a class in the NHRA where we can get young people involved. Through my career, I had these great mentors and teachers. And, um, and I thought, you know, we need to keep these kids and young people in the next generation coming to the track. But it was tough because 
we were building motorcycle powered cars. So a lot of these young people, their dad maybe didn't know about motorcycles or they had a motorcycle dad didn't know much about cars. Now we've, again, we've got this electric thing that doesn't require all this maintenance. And in 2016, I heard Don Garlitz in an interview discussing the quest for 200. I'd done some land speed racing as well. So there were a couple of things I was the first to 200 in and then I heard of this, the quest for 200. And I thought, Don Garlitz is talking about electric cars, what's going on? The Quest for 200. And there were a number of people that were involved in it. John Metric, I started looking into it. I called a, a partner of mine in Montana named Larry Carroll, and you'll see it's on the front of our team. It's called Carroll Huff and Barger. And uh, Larry Carroll, I was, we were already in business together doing a race car project with some Ford two liter turbos and a chassis design that I had. When we heard about the Quest for 200, and I called Larry and I said, and Larry, by the way, owns an oil company called the Carroll Oil Company. He's a retired petroleum engineer, a hot rod nut, has dozens and dozens of the most beautiful restored hot rod cars, muscle cars that you've ever seen. And I told Larry, I said, you know, this electric thing's happening and Don Garlitz is involved. And there's a scene going on and they're trying to get to 200. And I think it was some minor design changes in the car that we can do it, but it's gonna be expensive. And uh, the oil man said, yes. And that's what got me to the electric. And then the next thing was, I didn't know a damn thing about it, zero. I could write a book on what I didn't know about it. So I called a buddy of mine, Jim Hoogerheide, a motorcycle racer, but he had raced some motorcycles in Bonneville and we did some land speed racing together and he was on an electric bike called the Lightning, uh, made by Richard Hadfield, Lightning Motorcycles, they're amazing. I asked him, I said, who do I call? He gave me the name of a company to call. I call a company in Oregon, built some great products. They realized quickly I was serious. I said, now I need to learn how I put these products together. They gave me the name of a shop teacher that was in Bothell, Washington. They said, he's familiar with it, call him. He's in the audience here today, is Pat McHugh. And uh, uh, Pat came out and we started this project. And the, the first one didn't work. Uh, Pat had some other things to do, uh, you know, with Ford or with Chevy and then Ford. And I kind of went off in a, our own uh, direction, made a different plan, I tried the second version of our car. It didn't go 200. It ran well. And then uh, what people see downstairs today is the third version of our car. So, I mean, the crossovers and the similarities to our gas counterparts, I think you're going to see more fans or, or, or purists like me that, or maybe the open, we've always been into new technologies, my teams, whether it was my boat team, the car team, motorcycle teams, you know, it's technology. And I'm, I'm interested in learning and we teach, we work with a lot of students and they're really interested in it. And I'll tell you, I went into this with one goal in mind, to be the first to 200 an electric car. What I've come out of it with is a, a whole new knowledge, a whole new appreciation, uh, years of, of fun. Uh, and uh, we found that this car has generated so much attention from the young people. The University of Wyoming for the second time just flew up 19 of their engineering students to my shop uh, for a lecture. And, the follow and then they flew them up for two days. One day at my shop, the next day at Boeing. And I'll tell you, my top fuel bike never brought in students like that. We've taken the car to universities. We've had it at high schools, K through eight STEM programs. That doesn't happen with my boat. It's never happened with my top fuel programs. And we have good race programs. We're not back markers. But we've never seen interest like this from the next generation. So the moral of the story is make friends with an oil man yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then figure out what you want to do from there yeah thank you uh, for coming out today farm truck and asian when they gave me the uh, when they gave me the list of panelists i went farm truck and asian electric what are you crazy but uh asian joins us up here on the stage you guys actually put together an electric s10 sparky if i'm not mistaken right yeah you're right man i mean i think the infancy starts with i, I raced rc cars uh, tent scale electric RC cars when I was 15, 14, 15, 16, raced professionally, life happened, life goes on, you get into real cars. Uh, but that never le left my mind, right? And so I always had this idea of uh, building a full blown electric car. And at that time, it was impossible. You know, guys with enough money and, and enough technology. I think the EV1 came out. And you don't know an oil guy? Hey, I don't know an oil <laughs> guy, you know? So um, I need to be in the petroleum business. Uh, but and then, you know, life goes on. And then I started following a truck called Smokescreen on the internet. When the internet was in its infancy as well. And he kept making waves and uh, Dennis Brube had the truck and he was doing these giant burnouts and it was electric and he was going out there blasting the quarter mile, doing some 10 second passes, really just trying to, and, and here was this 
regular looking pickup. It was, the, it was the one of the few electric vehicles that looked like a regular vehicle. And I was like, man, I, really, I can really dig that. I'm a, I like trucks, I like pickups, I was, I was into it. Uh, and then fast forward uh, 20 years later, and I was just uh, browsing the internet and on, on an on a online advertising, and he had it for sale. And I think his buddy had it for sale, and Dennis had moved to the Philippines. And I was like, well, it, there wasn't a price on it. And so I called the number and I was like, is this an old ad? Are you guys still selling this truck? And he said, yeah, come to Arizona and get it. And so I think I, you know, I put my, I, I cracked open my piggy bank. I drove up there to Arizona and stuck at my driveway for a little bit. And I just, I guess it was a, a goal moment to say, I, I got the truck that I was, that fascinated me for so long. And then it just sat there. And then the discovery came along and said, hey, farm truck, Asian, we want you guys to build eight impossible builds. We want you to put together eight things that have never been done before. And we had put together this list and farm truck and I got together and the eighth, there, we were missing one more. And I pitched it to farm truck. I said, farm, what about this electric? It's not the kookiest thing that we can do, but it's different and we've never done it before. And he said, you know what? We'll give it a shot. If we think we could, th there's a chance to make an episode and make people smile at the end of it, let's give it a try. And so we started putting together, started making phone calls, called John, started talking to Huff a little bit, making our way through it. They introduced us to people. We started to put together, uh, brought in a local uh, Tulsa tech to, to help us out. And you know what? It was a wealth of information building it. You know, our goal was just to build something kooky. Our goal was just to get this thing out there, learn as much for us as possible, but also dumb it down. The hardest thing to do in the EV world is to dumb this down. It's almost impossible to, to give everybody a piece of information without giving them all of it, right? So um, to inspire people to say, you need to build an EV vehicle, you can't just do that, right? There's a lot of steps before that has to happen. You have to be obsessed. And so the one thing about cars is that it requires a level of obsession Electric vehicles requires a different level of obsession because it, it, it's so multifaceted. You have to, you, you have to be, I don't, it requires a level of intelligence first, which I don't have. And so <laughs> I had to bring in, uh, we had to bring in so many different people. Farm truck and I brought something in, you know, we can build a camper car. We can build a car powered by air. We can build anything other than an electric vehicle. So the complications in this was probably one of the most difficult builds ever just because we leaned on the experts so heavily to help us and we still failed. Right, and so it was one of the vehicles. It was a success in the sense that we built it. It was a success in the sense that we made it down the track. But it was, it was a failure in the sense that the technology that's available right now today is requiring everybody to get obsessed, and we're noticing that. We th this this electric movement requires people to to be interested in it enough, to educate themselves enough, to do the boring groundwork, um, and, and then to ask so many questions that you, you end up creating en enemies, you know? <laughs> and so um, we're here now. We got the truck. We built it. Um, I continue to be fascinated by what these guys continue to achieve. Um, and I'm still waiting for the day when the technology is embraced enough so that anybody can do what we did, um, plug and play, learn what it's about, and then maybe build their own. Um, but right now, you know, battery technology technology, lithium, there's a lot of politics involved in all of this action, but at the end of the day, all these guys just want to go fast. I agree. And by the way, if you're wondering, I asked Farm Truck if he was coming up and he said, no, he said, Asian's the nerdy guy. He's the one that's going to talk about the electric stuff. And that brings us to Al Thomas, who is the current president of NEDRA. NEDRA, of course, the National Electric Drag Racing Association, been around since 1996. But uh, it's seen quite a resurgence, I think, in but the last decade or so, right? I mean, a lot more. Since there are now electric cars that somebody can go drive off of a showroom floor and come out and get involved, I think that uh, all of a sudden, You've got a bigger, I don't know if fan base is the right word, but definitely uh, there's definitely a whole lot more interest in Nedra now because people are wanting to race these cars that they're driving on the street just like everybody did when they were younger. Huge, huge interest. But Asian has a point, and you need to learn. There's a lot of learning to do. I'm a college professor. Uh, I'm going to start a new race team, Carol and Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, you found your oil man. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, uh, I came to this uh, EV world. I'm a, I'm a college professor. I teach automotive technology. Um, about 2006, we started a motorsports club, and my students were really excited, but we didn't have a car. They said, you know, if we're going to be a club, we should have a car. So we built an uh, ethanol-powered 
1991 Mustang, a 10 second car, runs straight ethanol. We make our own ethanol. So corn fed and up, up jumps the corn marketing program of Michigan and they offer us a grant and uh, pretty soon we have a team with a trailer and we're racing and it's really exciting. So a couple years later, I start a hybrid and alternative fuels class and we're learning about hybrid cars and we have uh, different types of hybrids and electric cars coming in and we're learning about them and uh, my motorsports club says, we should have an electric race car. And I said, wow, I hadn't thought of that. You know, next thing you know, uh, we've got a 48 volt electric dragster, 190 inch wheelbase, and we set a, a 48 volt world record, which you know, once you learn, once you do learn about this, you'll know that that's a, a very conservative voltage level by today's standards. But in the next week, I received a phone call from a guy that wanted to sponsor us by the name of Sean Lawless. Never met the man in my life, cold call. He says, I'm gonna fund your program. If you've done this, we're gonna help you. Next thing you know, we're setting world records with a really fast car, you know, 10, 11 seconds uh, by our standards. And that, the college didn't really want to go much faster than a, a 10 second car. Um, through this whole process though, uh, we found benefactors and we were then, uh, we received a donation from a, a Nedra member, longtime Nedra member, and now we have a 240 inch wheelbase Spitzer chassis that's a, a legitimate race car. It won't run with these guys' cars will, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. And my students are here, I have, I have a few students here that are really interested in this program. I retired from the, from the college. I'm going back as an adjunct and they reinstated me as uh, the motorsports club advisor. So I'm, I'm continuing to run the motorsports program. My students throughout the years, last 15 years, we've went racing a lot of times. And one thing I noticed is when I was young, I used to run to the fence when the top fuel cars came to line. My students don't run to the fence. They don't even, they don't really care about the top. In fact, it's too loud. And if it's not a, if it's not a Honda or a Subaru with a laptop sitting on top, they're not, they're not interested. And drag racing is gonna die if, if we don't embrace what's coming. And the electric cars, they love that you can plug in a computer, tune the software, make the thing, figure out why, it's, why it doesn't have traction. When I grew up, you know what? You'd, you'd slide underneath the next guy's car that was running faster than you and figure out how his rear suspension was set up. That's all you could do. Now we have all these sensors. We can, we can figure out accurately what's going on with the rear suspension and we don't know what's happening with electric cars now. It's like going back to the 50s. It's a lot of technology, it's a lot of invention. We've got different, different platforms, different thinking. It's really exciting. And that's, I really love it because of that. Well, I want to tell you that drag racing is not going to die ever, as long as there's road construction, because when the sign says merge and that guy's a half a car in front of you, drag racing will go on forever. Uh, you guys all mentioned it, Asian. I'm going to start with you talking about you have to have the, the obsession, the knowledge, and my f initial thought is I am very mechanical, okay? I can take something apart. I can see what the deal is. I can put it back together. You can't see inside a battery. You can't see inside a controller. You can't see. In is that where all of that extra knowledge, is that, is that what, you, what you had to learn, or can you expand a little on that? Yeah, I, it's the intangibles. You're absolutely right, because, I mean, when you, you rebuild a carburetor, you can, you can know, okay, the needle and seat, I changed both of those. I, I, you can adjust the float. I can see where the fuel level's at. That, that's all, I think that, that instant gratification is often what people are after. And with, with EVs, that instant gra it's a delayed gratification with the EV, you know, because the results are on the track. The results are the consistency that you can bring. Uh, battery temperatures, it's things like that. So uh, it, it's
it's a different type of environment when you're getting into the reward system of what you're trying to achieve. You have to have a very clear goal and, and set it in terms of uh, trying to reach that because if you're just like, I'm just going to dabble in it, there's no dabbling. There's no dabbling in EV. You either go all in or you're not doing it. Um, and so that, that level of obsession is absolutely a requirement from the very beginning. You have to have that. Steve? And, you, you know, I'll uh, interject something here. You know, I was involved during this transition. When I started my project, AEM systems weren't out. And I'm, I'm going to put a little focus on that, and it'll make sense in a moment. Uh, so we had multiple components, right? So the fundamental, and I decided I was going to build an AC drag, so go against the grain, what anybody had ever done. And I'm, we're going to do try and do this with an AC dragster. And uh, so the requirements went up. He was talking about a 48 volt battery, you know, in our car there's an 800 volt battery. So uh, this is big stuff. This will kill you long before it will shock you. It will, you know, it, you won't know it happened. And uh, so you, there's a, there is a high risk in it. but. In 17, when we, or in 16, when we started the car, everything was analog, right? So we have a battery. Now with the AC system, I have to take that DC power, invert it into AC power, right? We all know what inverters are. Then I had to go from that and control it, and then from that to the motor. And there, there wasn't a component. We had like nine switches on the dash. We had multiple, and they had to be turned on in a particular order. Enter AEM a year later. We're seeing what forecasting what that there was going to be this market this high performance market aem designs this computer now oh and and the other thing that we didn't have initially was enough data acquisition there's so much going on i mean we have four four inverter controllers we each of those basically is a processor right so and so we have can capabilities of of recording data from each of these components but you stack them all up and there, was, there really weren't any systems that would record this much data. AEM comes in, all built into one. That now we're getting familiar things that hot rodders know about, brand names like AEM. Then Holly lo loves it so much, and they predict the future. They're looking at the future of, of, the, of high performance. And so Holly purchases AEM. For, it was a big deal. Uh, when companies and brands like that start coming in, and providing us products that, when we look at my data screen, it looks just like an uh, ICE data screen, right? I'm seeing the same RPM curves, I'm seeing things that we're familiar with. And that really, for us, that changed it. Without that, first off, we didn't, couldn't really control four motors properly. We could control two, but four, probably not. And you know, we replaced a four inch diameter bundle of wire with a can line. Uh, once these new, once this communication came up with AEM, and we're gonna see other familiar companies get involved with this. AEM's not gonna be the last. You know, I mean, how many companies make chips for, uh, you know, OBD2 stuff to plug it in and, and chip your deal? All of that will come to electric, if not already there, and uh, or, it's already started. Uh, it, it, this isn't the future. All of the stuff we're talking about is downstairs, you can touch it. it you know, it's not a leprechaun, it's real. Uh, no longer a theory and, and you know, getting these companies in. Um, we have a couple of camps in the internal combustion engine, piston driven world, right? We have the, the guys that want one wire alternator and a, and a carburetor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have the fuel injection guys with all the sensors and they're running hard. And those two camps often fight, mm -hmm. you know? But they're, they're learning, the, there's a steep learning curve with all the sensors, you know, to figure it out. I, I can tell you that when I did, the latest incarnation of, I've got a 67 Mustang I've had since I was in high school. I kicked and screamed and fought because everybody was telling me, you're going to put fuel injection on this thing. And I'm telling you, I'm throwing torque wrenches at people. And I put fuel injection on it, I may never buy another carburetor. Uh -huh. once, right. once you get the thing, no, I'm telling you, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Once you get the thing set and straightened out and you find out what it'll do. John, I noticed you were listening along and nodding your head a whole lot. We're talking about all of the technology that's come along very recently. You go further back. Let's talk a little bit about what you started with and where we've come from there, if you want to expand on that. Um, so originally uh see the fellow in the seat back there the uh, george hamstra sponsored my team uh with this uh, net game warp nine motors and they were the pretty much a standard uh other than the the, the smoke screen had a little different motor but uh it was pretty much a the only thing you could go to back in uh, i don't know 10 15 25 years ago now 
Um, so we were running t two and then four of those warp motors and pushing them, pushing them, pushing them, and you see sometimes push them a little too much. Yeah, when you're doing a fire burnout with an electric car, that's a bad thing. <sighs> yeah. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> We drove that car back to the pits. That that, that looks worse than it was. Uh, but they, they spit they spit fire <laughs> when you're uh, running them way too high RPM. So there's this there's that issue. This is like the carburetor is to the fuel injector. This these were just here's the voltage. We've got a current controller and you're throwing it to it. There's no feedback, no sensors, no nothing. And so we, we've uh, on, we popped a few motors uh, in in the day. I've, Thank you. Uh, I've Thank seen you, top fuel cars look like that from turning a little too much RPM too, but I ain't never seen anybody drive one back afterwards. <laughs> it's it's just the graphite in the brushes on that picture there, and uh, the, they overheat, and then the graphite comes off and it burns, and so it's, it looks a lot worse than it was. Uh, what is graphite? <laughs> <laughs> so your your car had. Is, yeah. <laughs> So there's another picture there of a, a motorcycle doing about 180, and he, he was losing a motor there. And then there's the, uh, cars that have lost batteries as well. So there's a picture of a car losing a battery. Yeah, that's uh, definitely definitely not good. No. School of hard knocks. M motorcycle holds the quarter mile elapsed time record, right? That's right. I wanted to make sure we, we mentioned that uh, the, the, the motorcycles in the, in the world here. I, I had some photographs here of, uh, of, of the motorcycles here. Where, where are they? Shoot. Oh, here, here. So down in the lower right is uh, Larry Spiderman McBride. Uh, on the upper right is Scotty Polachek. And then on the left is a fellow named Jeff Dysinger. And these, uh, the, 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 the blue, uh, the rocket bike on the lower right, I think it's uh, been knocked off now by Hans and, uh, and uh, uh, the True Cousins team in uh, Europe. So uh, they're, they're the current uh, world record holders at like six, uh, eight. Steve? Six, and you know, that, that blue bike started out as the Orange County Choppers project as well, too. So that, you know, there was, again, a television show that was looking for something new, kind of exciting. So OCC got into that. And that's it. Paul Seniors, uh, you know, he's down in Florida now, has started a roadhouse bar and grill sort of thing. And uh, we are in discussions right now of bringing that bike or an updated version of that bike back and trying to get this record back from the Europeans, uh, bring it back to the U.S. And Larry's, Larry and I are talking about, you know, riding it, who's going to ride it, and if, I think we're going to go into it as a partnership deal. Let me ask you this. If you had a magic wand, what's the one thing that you need right now? If batteries. You that's it, huh? Yeah, batteries, yeah. It's... Uh, it's kind of the last hole in the market. Everything's custom built, right? So, uh, you know, you don't just go into the store and buy a battery off the shelf. We can go buy a controller off the shelf, a motor. We can buy a computer off the shelf, a gas pedal off the shelf, or throttle pedal, uh, or whatever we call it, a potentiometer uh, uh, with a foot lever on it. Uh, you're, you're never going to get the general public to change from gas pedal exactly. to potentiometer. Yeah. I can we need a that. land bridge between here and China. Uh -huh. and yeah, yeah. So. we can get that bridge. Yeah. So I think uh, what we could use is uh, certainly domestic manufacturing domestic. of batteries. And, uh, uh, you know, domestic manufacturing of batteries and performance batteries. So, and it will hit. It's, this is not uh, unrealistic. You know, there are going to be companies... Uh, I can't tell you exactly who, all who. Well, I'll tell you, E3 spark plugs went into the lithium battery market themselves. There's another spark plug company that I work with that um, is going into the lithium battery market. And, but these are large scale OEM things, but we're gonna, this is how hot riding and racing started, right? You go to a junkyard and you, you buy some cool parts and you bring it back and you mix and match some things and you make your thing lighter and more powerful and louder or whatever it was that you did when you were young and you were getting involved in this. You, this is your tour park lawnmowers to build a go-kart. Now we're repurposing, could you go to the boat? Sure. Uh, now we're sure. repurposing batteries. So like I just bought 70 uh, Tesla battery modules Oop. and we're utilizing 64 of them in this boat uh, that I'm building right now. This is a 36.6 uh, Skater Cat uh, with the same power drivetrain uh, and power system. So we're, we're going to wrecking yards. You know, people say, what are you gonna do when all the batteries are battery? You wreck the Teslas, they're all gonna go underground. You know, a lot of them are gonna get used up for things like this and used up for energy storage for people's homes. And a, a Tesla power wall contains one of those. We have uh, 64 of them in this boat. So, uh, are they heavy? Yeah, they're water cooled. You know, so, so we're gonna find these things, people repurposing Tesla motors and splitting the cases. I mean, this is going on today. 
And we're, we're gonna see battery companies come out with almost standardized cases, and the inside, the, the, the chemistry of those batteries will be built to your needs. And we're seeing things now that we didn't have even three years ago, things like common type of plugs Right, so um, th three years ago, depending on whose brand that you had, depending on what type of cable in that you needed to make, and, and this is, you, you can't make a mistake on it. Like Asian was saying, I mean, it's, it's critical, it's easy, but it's, it's critical. So attention to detail and things like that. So uh, now we have common plugs, which is awesome. I mean, that's I'm, a huge thing in our deal. I'm thinking with Al's system originally, Tapping the wires together to see if you've got a circuit would probably work. I'm guessing not with your boat, huh? Yeah, no, this, uh, so this boat's kind of, uh, it's going to have a whole lot of power, man. We've got seating for five in it. We took the race canopies off of it. Our target's 150 miles an hour. Um, until recently, nobody had broken 100. But, uh, this is a, a really neat project. I'm fortunate to have found a, a customer, you know, that wanted me to do this and uh so yeah this is a, a cool project and we're going to get more customers like that my shop in seattle i have a motorcycle shop primarily harleys i raced harleys forever uh so we do a lot of performance things this year i've been getting calls like that boat and other customers like that boat steve we're ready to do it now where do we go they're making the same i'm getting i've gotten 10 phone calls on that this year last year i had one I, I've seen the same thing on the boats as well. Just really? like, give me a, I want 4,000 horsepower. I'm like, okay, yep. we'll just. And the marine it's industry coming. is going to be a, an easier market for us to get into. Um, the marine guys, I've had offshore boats. We don't really want it that loud. You know, we want to take some girls out, go have a good time. Uh, that, so the noise, pulling out of the marina when you've got, you know, 468s cackling, you know, dry exhaust running out the back of the boat. And sometimes you've got to put your head down. The electric and a 1200 horsepower mercury blower motor uh, with the transmission on it, all the pulleys, the pumps are hanging, uh, it costs $250,000. And Mercury's racing program is 50 grand a year to keep it serviced, if you don't break anything. So I now a, we've got budgets. I got a buddy of mine that has just about that much battery in a boat, but it's just to run his stereo. <laughs> He's talking about, you know, put, <laughs> going out on a lake with girls on your boat, that would, yeah. uh, that would run the thing for a while. That's, that's fascinating though. I, I, I know you're from Washington. You mentioned Pat's from Washington. I know Washington, obviously, a lot of electric cars up there, a lot of electric technology up there. Al, do you find there's spots in the country that are, you know, very, very diverse or very, and some that maybe that, you know, I'm just wondering from a membership standpoint, do you see some places in the country that are, that are a whole lot more saturated? Typically south. Yeah, the weather is okay. better. And the, the west coast is a temperate climate so they're they're able to run electric vehicles more often if you go to michigan where i live you know we're we're buckling down for four feet of snow right it doesn't it's not conducive to electric cars that much but we get a nice summer we can run we can race but electric cars unless they're a tesla or something aren't adopted there there are not a lot of people building their own electric cars up there unless it's a race car. I got so, a question. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, you say most of it's south. You go to the west coast, you go to California, every other car is a Tesla. Yeah. Do, do you believe that, you know, because we're mostly up here for the aftermarket, right? Which is, which is a different language than, than talking about, okay, going out there and buying a Tesla turnkey and going out and, and driving electric cars. Do you believe that the, the Tesla cars, the electric cars, the factory produced cars are helping lead the charge in this or are they hurting the language for aftermarket? You know what I'm saying? Because that's the question is everyone's like, okay, you're into EV, you have a Tesla. No, it's not that kind of EV. And how do you explain that? So is, is, the, is the factory production, the, the green movement, the clean energy movement, is that helping or hurting the aftermarket EV industry? It's a great question, right? I don't know. And I, I see it both ways. I, I think our government position in shoving it down people's throats is, is the biggest detractor. Now, I, I would prefer that the technology sell itself. And if that happens, you build a better mousetrap and we're going to have electric cars, right? And I think we're really on the verge of that. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of differences out there, and, and I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I've driven a lot of electric cars, and I and I'm I still love a good running piston driven engine, right? I love it, but I would I would prefer to have an electric car that I get back and forth to work with all week, very very uh, miserly, 
operation, right? And low maintenance. And then I, I want my piston driven drag car for the weekend. And you know, we have to use the word sustainability. Uh, you know, it's oftentimes hooked up with the green movement and our planet, but there, there is a reality to this. You know, people don't have to do everything. You don't have to go nuts, but just everybody does a little something, right? If you got a recycle bin, you're going to throw the stuff in the recycle bin. We have two, two types of people that walk up to my car. We traveled the country this year, uh, last year with the NHRA. We went east coast to west coast. Uh, at, we've done four different national events. When we see, I, I, when the, even at this show, old knuckle draggers like me walk up and ask me how much horsepower does the car make? Anybody that's 30 and younger ask me how many kilowatts is it? I have the same thing. I got a slide up there to yeah. explain the same thing. The guy on the right is saying that'll never work. And that's younger, <laughs> this next generation, they are concerned about sustainability. They are concerned about their planet. They're young, they got their lives in front of them. You know, we're watching these climate change things right now. They're taking effect, even affecting our racing. A lot of rain on weekends where it usually doesn't rain. We're having, you know, we were in Phoenix this year. And I had my electric car there with the NHRA. Nationals was 38 degrees outside. <laughs> you know, there's frost on the ground in the morning uh, up in Scottsdale. So, the, but the next generation cares, I guess that's my point. And so they look at the electric vehicle, not like it's being shoved down their throat, because they're, they're available for sale and they're making the choice to buy them. And we're gonna have hacks. We're gonna have tuner chips for electric cars. It will happen. You'll have upgraded batteries for electric cars. You'll, it, it already has happened. You can get in with your laptop and not, not have a stock Tesla anymore. Well, see, my thought on that is kind of, the, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. People are always going to want to hop their cars up. And, you know, to get back to what Asian was asking, I think the fact that, you know, if there's 10 electric cars out there, then there, I, don't, I don't see a big aftermarket, right? Who's going to get involved in something that you have 10 potential customers? But if you have a million of them out there, all of a sudden now you start seeing aftermarket opportunities. And my personal thought anyway is that, the number of electric cars being on the road is good for what you guys are trying to do because it's going to drive the aftermarket to get involved. I don't care if I can go buy a Tesla Plaid that runs 930s. Can I make well, it run 880s? That's, that's right. what right. I want to know. Yeah. That's another question. You can buy a custom steering wheel from Holly for that Tesla. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, that's that's yeah, all you but get. It's interesting that, that's all yeah. you get. <laughs> but, but it's interesting that, the, that our, our hot rod companies are, I mean, not necessarily embracing it. Of course, crankshaft manufacturers could care less. But electronics companies in particular, sensor companies, uh, you know, they see this, of course, as, a, as an opportunity. And, and everybody wants to be, a, you know, I'm blessed to have been here. It took a lot of people. It certainly wasn't just me. But, you know, as a business owner and as a racer, we want to be at the top of our respective industry when it becomes popular. There's always that one guy in the room, you know, that you're looking at going, that guy was at the right spot at the right time. And right now, for any business owners and stuff that are out there also, or mechanics, you know, looking into these things, training uh, on e how to be an EV mechanic, for instance. Uh, I know Pat has a program at his high school. We're seeing these programs pop up everywhere because there's a future in it. And we're not talking about a past in it, but we, we do have this future. Love it or hate it, um, it's, the next one's coming along, they, they're, they're loving it right now. They enjoy it. electric motorcycles. You know, you don't, every time that you want to go, it's opening up the door. I see it at my shop, uh, single moms coming in and buying an electric bike or asking me where they can go buy an electric uh, mini bike for their kid or asking where they can buy a mini bike for their kid. I remind them that the carburetor is going to have to be cleaned every time that he wants to take it out. You know, the pilot jet's going to be plugged up completely. It's uh, going to be smelly and stinky gas. So they get, they get the electric one. They can ride around their neighborhood. They're learning their skills. We're seeing this go on at go-kart tracks. We're seeing it go on in neighborhoods. We're seeing a, a, a motocross track in downtown San Diego that's uh, there for electric motocross bikes. And these are badass machines. And drag racing was one of the great places to start this because we didn't need a battery that would last for three hours. So that's why you're seeing this more so in drag racing, I think, than a lot of other forms. And in motorcycles, because they're so light, and they're, very, they're so much more efficient and smaller scale. So yes, they're expensive. We see it in our scooters and our normal daily transportation, but the chips will be there. The next generation uh, is embracing it. Well, you know, we're all in the racing business, so with all of those cars that are being sold out there, all of them that are being driven, how do we get them to the racetrack? 
what, 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 what was the question? Don't, don't everybody answer at the same time. I would yeah, say well, I, over, I don't understand uh, the question. over 10 or 12 years, I've seen where like the, the very first Nissan Leafs were coming out and they were, they were, nobody wanted to take them to the track because they're under warranty and they, you know, you go to the drag strip, you blow the warranty and every, so there's a, a certain period of time that had to pass and you notice the IHRA uh, fellow, uh, what's his name, uh, is a 2014 Tesla S won the EV championship. What was his name, Todd Keith? Uh -huh. Todd, Todd Payne. Payne. And uh, 2014, so, you know, that's, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So Seriously. he's out of warranty. He's, he's uh, running an older thing, and he's already getting in there. He's doing stuff with the tires and a little bit with the suspension, and he's ripping it, lightening it up, and taking out <laughs> sound deading uh, weight and, and, and lightening it up. So it's beginning. It's just like that first car is just old enough now that he can hand me down. He's not worried about crashing it because it's not under war you know, still under warranty. And he's starting to hack it, hack it, you know. And the next thing will be a tuner chip, like yep. you said. And then and the NHRA next thing will be a, a class. Now a we've class. got electric classes, yeah. in IHRA, and in the NHRA. It's so yeah, we run, we run specific fun, classes yeah. just for electric cars if, if people want to do that. But I mean, the question is, how do we get the people that are driving these cars? How do we convince them to come out to the racetrack? I, I think it has to become cool. Yep, it, it does. Ha it has to become cool, right? Holly did. Holly does their uh, their high voltage event in Sonoma. You know, Holly started yeah, the LS huge. Fest. Holly started the LS Fest. The first LS Fest had 20 people at it, the, or 50 people. I'm sorry, 50 50 entries at the first LS Fest. Since Holly is one of our sponsors, they share this information with me. When we were at the the first high voltage event, which was last year. There were 250. And look at where the LS Fest has gone now. And so Holly's banking that if we can make a cool event, and I, I think racing in general needs a, 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 a booster. You know, we need to make events out of this. There has to be more going on than just cars going down the track. You know, get some music involved. A buddy of mine who's a promoter, he did uh, some cage fighting, and they had freestyle motocross stuff going on over at the cage doing backflips on bikes while the guys were in the cage fighting. People were interested, right? So uh, having some diversity at the racetrack um, that's geared towards the next generation you know maybe uh, you know some real simulators at the track for the family to get into uh, you know the electric go karts thing some like live that. betting yeah live betting live but betting. you I know the first thing that came to my mind when you said that is this type of dialogue will start informing the people that it's out there right you are you are causing the, the landslide right now to bring in electric drag racing. It's your fault. It's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> happy, to be, happy to be of service. I, I will tell you that, um, and I've reached out to a number of uh, people on my side of the fence and asked them, just kind of doing a little research for this. They are, there's a lot of consensus out there that there are a number of electric car owners that will come out to the racetrack but don't necessarily want to race in a structured event. You know, they want to come out, they want to see how fast their car is, maybe they want to race their neighbor, but trying to get them involved in coming back on a weekly basis has been a little bit of a difficult sell. It, it's, it's scary, right? Like, yeah. it's scary to jump in your car and go down the track while everybody's watching, right? So you have to be brave, right? You have to think it's cool first to get you to the stage, and then you have to be brave enough to make a hit down the track, right? So we do these daily driver events with regular cars. We ask people to bring their minivans on the track. It's free. You can do it. Just get a feeling, race with an outlaw, bring your daily driver out on the track. They won't do it. It's so hard to get people just to make a hit down that track. No, no risk, right? And it's easy. We'll help you. We'll line you up. We'll get you there. No one wants to do it because it takes a level of courage to get out there, get in your car, and commit to doing something you've never done before and and then that yeah that's right and the ratio begins to dwindle because there's fewer electric cars so y y it's hard finding uh, ice vehicles to do it it's going to be even harder to find people with teslas to to get down the track and they think it's going to hurt the car or they're going to make a fool of themselves um so it takes it takes courage and there's there's no way to really uh, assist that other than to show them that we're doing it too john do you find that when you've got your car out Obviously, every time I've seen somebody with an electric hot rod that's out, especially at one of our events, they attract a lot of attention just because they're so different from everything else we have. I'm curious how many people come up with just the curiosity factor about your car and how many come up that have some kind of an electric car that are curious and have a question about that. I um, tell you what, the Vince, uh, I'm down in Texas and they're just the ET and NHRA ET bracket, there, there aren't any, you know, you're not putting on an ET 
bracket. So the right. only events I'm going to would be one that Nedra is putting on and or one I called myself and said, hey, listen, it's a Texas, Texas winners, you know, come on down and, and I get five people maybe. And then um, so we're out test and tuning mainly, mainly and uh, exhibition racing. So uh, this picture uh, is real common for like, I just can't get any work done. I'll, I will pull up and they'll see the car and then 20 people will come over to the to the pits and like I can't I have to answer all these questions and you know trying to check your tires and your lug nuts and you know trying to turn the car around charge it and, and uh, so many people just want to what is it we doing how fast can it go I just saw how fast you know and people are, people are scared of things that they just don't know about yeah like track owners <laughs> right? track owners track owners well, right to, to, to uh, degree, we yeah. we were prevented from running in a bracket class right we could make exhibition runs for years well i do know that there was a fear at one point about one of these things crashes and catches on fire nobody knew what they'd do with it and that's you know i think that that slowed down the opportunity to get on the racetrack but i think that's that's it's getting back better the it's getting better in 2017 my battery wasn't allowed to come into this building uh, and my battery wasn't allowed at one of the nhra national uh, to go to an nhra national event uh, you know, the, through the COVID thing, some things lighten up and we came out of COVID and all of a sudden we're getting invitations and you don't have to take your battery out. I was like, are you sure? Everybody has said, yeah, no, you're fine. And, and back in 17, it was, you know, it's got to be parked. Before then, the University of, Ohio, of uh, Ohio has a Buckeye Bullet land speed car and it's a hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's an, it's an amazing machine, right? And the, the university has been working with this thing for about 10, 12 years now. And when they first brought it to Bonneville, uh, the SCTA made them park two miles away because they thought it was going to blow up the pits if something happened. And, and the pits are miles long, right, at Bonneville. But uh, uh, yeah, that fear level has come down. And rightfully so, uh, you know, we have hundreds of passes on ours and we're collecting data now. We can show safety officials how hot that it gets, you know, uh, and again, it's just development. It's just like the old stuff, you know, I mean, could you imagine a, uh, you know, a, a seven second street car, you know, years ago, but there's development of technologies and now we have them. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy how fast this is. And, and right now I feel like, and I, was, I got involved just before the hockey, you know, the graph's gonna be like a hockey stick. And I got involved just before that curve. And, and we're at the bottom of this hockey stick deal. As far as manufacturers, vendors go, um, people's acceptance into it. Uh, there's a lot of false information that's out there. And, and it became politicized. There's another big negative for it. You know, most, most uh, racers are going to be, most parts of the country are going to be wearing red hats. And they think that the, uh, of course, that the electric car comes from the evil Democrats and it's a policy thing. And it's, I, I don't want to get into, do I don't want to get into a political rabbit hole. Let's well, stay sure, this away from that. No, but, it, but it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's, it, the, the fan base politicized it. You know, it's not looked at as a hot rod. It's looked at as a, as a political statement. I didn't build it to save gas. It was built to go fast. I built mine to go fast. Well, I think, and again, I think what I said earlier, you know, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. When I was young, you could afford to buy a Camaro, a Mustang, a Roadrunner, whatever. You bought what you could afford, and then you went out and started trying to make it faster. Right. Uh, I remember when, you know, the, the Sport Compact thing was so big in NHRA, and, it, and the number of people on my side of the fence, whether it's hardcore racers or whether it's just that, you know, what are you kidding me? A, a Honda Civic with, you know, that stupid can on the back for a muffler in it. Front wheel drive. But right. They are no different than I was. These are young people that could afford those cars and that's what they had and that's what they were trying to make faster. And now, you know, the electric movement coming along and I think, you know, whatever you're gonna get, like I said, I know you can buy a Tesla to run nines. My first thought would be, how do we get it to go eights? And uh, Asian? You know, I, th I think another thing that this, this, there's a lot of uh, humble guys here on stage right now, but in this industry, there's a lot of ego. Th these guys are very approachable. You can come up, ask any question you want. They'll share their wealth of knowledge. Um, heck, these two guys are semi-retired. They're, they're more than willing to get the, get the ball rolling for anybody that's interested. But you go on the internet and it's flypaper. You say, you, you have a simple question, and this is why I, I've kind of wanted to brand it as dumbing it down, um, is that when they ask a question, they don't want the full answer. 
They don't want the exact answer. They want a quick answer to be interested. You've got to be able to capture them, give them a quick answer, get them interested, and hope they ask another question, right? And so I think there's a lot of big ego in this aftermarket EV world that is not allowing new people to get involved and get interested without shutting them down early. Interesting. Um, since we touched on a little bit a minute ago, uh, as far as how far the cars have come with acceptance from the sanctioning bodies from people at PRI bring it in the building. Is there still something in particular when the electric cars go to the racetrack from a safety standpoint that this absolutely positively must be here that maybe isn't um, on a weekend, on a, on a regular event? Uh, firefighting. Yeah, firefighting. You know, when, when we go to a track, it's uh, even our home track, uh, Pacific Raceway, so maybe have the most familiar uh, safety crew with electric vehicles. You know, I race, I test there a lot. I know Pat's there a lot. Uh, there's just some things that have been chemical fire extinguishers, for instance. We need more water fire extinguishers at the tracks, chemical fire extinguishers. Um, we bring our own. We have to bring our own. We have to train uh, the firefighter, you know, the rescue crews. Chemical fire extinguishers are conductive. You know, just some simple things like that. Uh, some some uh, standardized products, some battery chargers, pits that have some power outlets. Like when I was racing top fuel, right? it's a funny story. So I'm, when I race top fuel bikes, top fuel Harleys, of course, we have the weather data for every track throughout the season in the United States, our whole schedule. We have years of data, and they're usually pretty consistent. You know, we go back the same weekend every year, it's usually pretty close weather. That was the, what we had to have from track to track, to, you know, were the conditions. Now, I have a drawer full of three, you know, 30 amp to 40 amp twist lock adapters, three prong to twist lock, because every track has a different plug when we can go find out where to go. So it looks like I have a marina store in my uh, deal for every boat plug or something that there is to adapt. But when we start seeing some places that do have an area, have some outlets, I mean, they've got it for RVs that doesn't use that much electricity. You know, these uh, question, if there's a little fee for it, I'm sure that anybody would be happy to pay. You know, we got to take generators out to the track to recharge and it's noisy. Nobody wants to be around it. Uh, so there are a couple of concessions I think that tracks can make. I know Seattle's got some Tesla chargers um, that they've implemented right there at the track. Uh, uh, I think there are some things from safety to convenience that could help attract, the convenience thing could attract, uh, you know, some of the racers. Uh, the good news is a when we do the dragster, if you have ever totaled your kilowatts, uh, your kilowatt hours is very small. It's like one and a half to two. Yeah, so we average, uh, we figured out ours early on, it was uh, on average about 90 cents for one pass uh, based on our power prices in Seattle. So not only is it a small price, but you can recharge really quickly. So you can, these dragsters, you know, 15 minutes, I, I'm fine. I'm, I'm ready to go again. We just do a 7 2 and. Pfft. Yeah, Come when we're plugged into a wall right? outlet, we can do our turnaround time in 30 minutes, and a yeah. generator takes us over in about an hour and 10 minutes. Oh, I use my welder. Uh -huh. We got like a 12 kW. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge, huge welder. Yeah, so I think that there's going to be a couple of things. There will never be an electric-specific racetrack by any means, or, uh, or, a, or a, have to be a split, but certainly some things like power uh, availability. You know, we're not leaving j uh, jars of oil and, uh, you know, cans of oil leaving behind or things of that nature. Uh, that I know a lot of places, uh, you know, that these tracks, you know, they, you, people have to realize that the, the, the neighborhoods in this and the communities, not, it's not just the people that live next door, you know, all the people that live next door are complaining about, regardless of what's happening, they're always complaining about it. Noise is, of course, one of the first things, but, uh, you know, these guys, they come out and, and uh, you know, do ground, to do soil samples, uh, you know, the, 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 the city municipalities, uh, you know, there's a lot going on at a race racetrack that uh, racetrack owners need to think about and, I, and it's not going to happen it's a really small percentage and it's going to take a long time but i think that racetrack owners could use something that they could send back you know here's some of our noise mitigation plan just by involving the cars certainly isn't going to be everyone if i if i've got a racetrack no. i'm having electric cars out there tuesday night because you can't do anything else tuesday night mm -hmm. right you know alan we're working and we have a, a community working on a on a rules package that'll, that'll give entry-level people an idea of what they need to get into electric drag racing. So the NHRA is, is involved with this, and we're, we're having meetings. Are you talking about with a street car or with a race-specific car? Yeah, all the way through. Okay. 
So yeah. And the NHRA is uh, lifting of that roll cage thing for the Tesla. And they, the NHRA has made some concessions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, lower in the ET, you know, without the mandated uh, roll cage, if you leave your OEM things on. And the, 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 the progress has started. We've been uh, very drag race heavy here, and we don't have yeah. a whole lot of time left, but I want to touch on uh, something, and Al, this may, be, this may be, you can answer this more than anybody else. Let's get away from drag racing for a minute. What other segments, where else is electric becoming bigger, and is there any technology crossover, anything that can go back and forth? I mean, obviously, you know, from a, we'll just use something we're all familiar with, from a NHRA versus NASCAR standpoint, there's not a lot of crossover because what you can get away with in six seconds, you can't get away with for 500 miles. Well, we, we do have a, a late model downstairs that's electric. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know they've run some electric stuff in the Mint. They've run some off-road stuff. They've run... Uh, I'm yeah. just, well, Pike Speak. Every record now has been broken by electric motorcycle and electric yeah, The, on, the only physical difference is the size of the battery. That, that's it. I mean, otherwise, we're using the same technologies uh, ac across all motorsports, the same controllers, the same. The, the, contr the motors that are in my car are the same motors that are in that Formula E car that are downstairs. Right. And we're so, learning about cooling. We're learning. Uh, there's advancements. Yeah. Battery size is really the battery size and uh, configuration uh, for your purpose needs. You know, the batteries are purpose built. Otherwise, the equipment itself, that AEM, uh, you know, computer and their dashboards, I'm using it in the boat, I use it in my car. Uh, it's used in uh, road racing cars. So just different size batteries. So do you see any big growth again coming? You know, I'm not talking specifically drag racing, but just let's, let's get a little bit more general. Throughout the racing industry, I see interest. There's people want to apply this technology and I think they're starting to see that there are potential. There's, there's potential. If the rule packages will allow it, there's a potential to be faster than any piston-driven engine ever. Every, I predict, I really mean this too, I predict every record will be broken by an electric vehicle in a short period of time. I think, you know, uh, guys like Travis Pastrana, you know, bringing out his uh, electric rally car, making it cool. And, uh, you know, you put Pastrana on the, behind the wheel or something, it's going to be cool. And they'll tell you it's Ken the fastest Why, thing why do you think we put him in a top fuel car? <laughs> What's that? Why do you think we put him in a top fuel car? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, the image thing, uh, getting that associated right as not so that it's not a political statement, so that it's a fun statement. So, you know, here's something that you can do, man. It's gonna be fun. I got a 200 mile an hour dragster I can drive back from the finish line. It's cool. You know, 200 mile top fuel Harley takes six guys to run. I mean, this is, it's fun. It, it truly is fun. I mean, drive it to the staging lanes. I back it into the trailer. So some of those things that, uh, you know, you, it, it's inexpensive once it's done. It's a big up front, but after that, it's, you can drive Sometimes. it into the show. Yep. I, I still don't <laughs> know how to... driven it through these hallways. I, I still don't know how to put reverse on mine. I need help with that. I'm, I still don't have reverse. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I got that. I got a couple there. of... Uh, uh, someone was... Keep that truck. I don't know. You're taking a question about this guy's been... <laughs> Yeah. Was it and, and this just happened last S Friday? SCCA, what was it? SCCA. SCCA. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, a, thank you for sharing that. I had not I, heard of that either. Yeah, we were you. always outlaws. We would have sometimes yeah. we'd have the SCCA. Uh, yeah. Our, our college has a Miata that's electric, and it's an autocross car. So... So, so anything in anything in that kind of like uh, thirty seconds to a minute, a minute and a half, the, the Pikes Peak, you know, that that's right in our target zone. I think uh, Pikes Peak, SCCA slalom, short slaloms. The the is uh, Jay Mackey here? Any, there he is. Uh, he runs a, a late model. How many laps is that? Wow. One hundred seventeen awesome. laps on a quarter mile oval. That's pretty. And impressive. you're doing all battery. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. 
That's amazing. We're uh, up your against competitive. time. I want to thank everybody for coming. Al, is there anything that uh, anything you want to add before we uh, before we pull the plug on this? I am at heart a piston driven guy, you know. But I see the technology. I think it's like the Wild West. You you build it and you come and race it, you know. And I love that. Whatever you can think of, because racing to me became too refined. If you didn't run this injector and that intake manifold and uh, you know you needed these wheels and that tire you you weren't competitive in the class you you try to go run 10-5 with something other than a 69 Camaro or whatever it is you know you can't be competitive I I like this electric world where it's the Wild West again it's definitely wide open Asian you know for me it's uh, don't go at it alone uh, try to find as many people, as many experts. Go, go with these guys first, right? And if you don't know how to do it, but you're intrigued or you're, you, know, you, you get the feeling that you could be obsessed, these guys, they're very active on their websites, on their social medias. Uh, ask them questions. They, they love to see that the industry is growing and they want to take a part in it. Don't go at it yourself. Uh, try to find everybody that you can to bring in. And you know what? Knuckle down. There's a lot of your friends that aren't going to like it. They're, they're going to they're gonna naysay it. You have to ignore all of that and uh, really nose to the grindstone, meet your goal, fix a goal, and then find friends to help you that really want to help you succeed. Steve? Uh, yeah. Um, like Al said, you know, he's a Piston fan. and I'm a race fan. I don't care. I don't care if it's got two wheels, four wheels, no wheels. I like high performance and specifically ultra high performance. The faster and more dangerous it is, the more I'm into it. Uh, and others like-minded, race fans don't have the pro real race fans. I mean, they just died in the wall. They don't have a problem with the electric. And, uh, and I'm hoping that the public, it's an, I practice this for a second. I come up to, I walk into this room and I tell y'all, I've got a dragster for you. You don't need a pit crew. You're like, all right, I'm listening. Goes 200 miles an hour. I'm listening. It, 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 you'll never even have to change the oil. I'm listening. You can drive it back from the finish line. I'm listening. I want one. It's electric. Oh, that's a bunch of crap. Forget it. I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> right. So there's this, just this thing right. I, I don't know what i want to say we'll get there i want to say one addendum to that i i know racers who had kids that started racing juniors and they had to give up their racing career to support their kids and it was crazy because they were competitive racers and they and to take care of a couple of kids running juniors that's another world where i know other people who have bought electric juniors and i know that's a that's a bad connotation to a lot of racers but now the guy's wife can plug the junior in and he can continue to race jay coughlin's grandson uh yeah. won the national championship in an electric dragster you know so uh yeah it's here yeah <laughs> the junior dragster thing is drag race mentality at its finest uh -huh. take a five horse briggs and stratton bend up some old pipe and let your kid have fun uh -huh. what if we make a billet one yeah and now throw some methanol in there. Can we get 100 horsepower out of that? Uh, John? Uh, we didn't spend much time on the juniors, but uh, George, uh, over the years, how many juniors do you think have been built? Yeah, Probably like 100, 150, at least 200 maybe. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's as many juniors out there as there are the, the, the conversion cars and stuff. Uh, that, so they're coming out. Um, I would say, uh, Lone Star, if you, at the, um, the, the topic was EV performance. And um, I would just say, do, do something with a car that you love, or with a bike that you love, or in a class that you love. I think I killed mine. Yeah, pick, pick something that you love, and then you're, you know. A, a, Hello? A, don't do it because you, don't do it because you're, you have an extra car, and you're like, oh, maybe I'm thinking about converting it. It's like a daily driver. And I've, no, do it because you love it. Uh, I got into it for the speed and the, and the quickness. Once you drive it, you, you're hooked. Right. Once you've driven it, you're just like slams you in your seat, unlike anything else. And uh, that's what Garlett said. He said, he says, I got to get a whole new seat and uh, just throws me in as, as hard as it hard as it, one of his other, you know, fast cars. So I understand. Get into it. Love it. Get into it. Love it. I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope you uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I hope you learned something. I want to thank everybody on the panel for taking time out of your day as well. Thank you guys for being here. Enjoy the rest of the show.